The way was wide enough for all of them to walk abreast, but they went one by one. The Lady at Amalthea walked in front by her own choosing. Prince Lear, Schmendrick, and Molly Grew, following, had only her hair for lantern, but she herself had no light before her at all, yet she went on as easily as though she had been this way before. Where they truly were, they never knew. The cold wind seemed real, as did the cold reef that rode on it, and the darkness that let them pass far more grudgingly than had the clock. The path itself was enough of a fact to bruise feet, and to be ch partly choked in places by real stones and real earth that had crumbled down the sides of the cave. But its course was the impossible way of a dream, pitched and skewed, rounding on itself, now dropping almost sheer, now seeming to rise a little, now working out and slowly down, and now wandering back to take them, perhaps, once again, below the great hall where old King Haggard must still be raging over a toppled clock and a shivered skull. Witch work, surely, Schmendrick thought, and nothing made by a witch is real at the last. When he, Then he added, but this must be the last. It will all be real enough if this does not last. As they stumbled along, he hurriedly told Prince Lear the tale of their adventures, beginning with his own strange history and the stranger doom, recounting the ruin of the midnight carnival and his flight with the unicorn, and continuing through their meeting with Molly Grew, the journey to Hagsgate, and Drin's story of the double curse on the town and the tower. Here he halted, for beyond lay the night of the Red Bull, a night that ended, for good or ill, with magic, and with a naked girl who struggled in her body like a cow in quicksand. He hoped that the prince would be more interested in learning of his heroic birth than in the origins of the Lady Amalthea. Prince Lear marveled suspiciously, which is an awkward thing to manage. "'I have known for a very long time that the king is not my father,' he said. "'But I tried hard to be his son all the same. "'I am the enemy of any who plot against him, "'and it would take more than a crone's gibbering to make me work his downfall. "'As for the other, I think there are no unicorns any more, "'and I know that King Haggard has never seen one. "'How could any man—' who had looked upon a unicorn even once, let alone thousands with every tide, possibly be as sad as King Haggard is. Why, if I had only seen her once and never again? Now he himself paused in some confusion, for he also felt that the talk was going on to some sorrow from which it could never be called back. Molly's neck and shoulders were listening intently, but if the Ma Lady Amalthea could hear what the two men were saying, she gave no sign. Yet the king has joy hidden somewhere about his life, Schmendrick pointed out. Have you never seen a trace of it truly, never seen its track in his eyes? I have. Think for a moment, Prince Lear. The prince was silent, and they wound further into the foul dark. They could not all always tell whether they were climbing or descending, nor sometimes if the passage were bending once again until the gnarly nearness of the stone at their shoulders suddenly became the bleak rake of a wall against their faces. There was not the smallest sound of the red bull, or any glimmer of the wicked light, but when Schmendrick touched his damp face, the smell of the bull came off on his fingers. Prince Lear said, Sometimes, when he has been on the tower, there is something in his face, not a light, exactly, but a clearness. I remember I was little, and he never looked like that when he looked at me, or at anything else, and I had a dream. He was walking very slowly now, scuffing his feet. I used to have a dream, he said, the same dream over and over about standing at my window in the middle of the night and seeing the bull, seeing the red bull, he did not finish. C. 
Seeing the bull driving unicorns into the sea, Schmendrick said, it was no dream. Haggard has them all now, drifting in and out on the tides for his delight. All but one. The magician drew a deep breath. That one is the Lady Amalfia. Yes, Prince Lear answered him. Yes, I know. Schmendrick stared at him. What do you mean you know? he demanded angrily. How could you possibly know that the Lady Amalthea is a unicorn? She can't have told you because she doesn't remember it herself. Since you took her fancy, she has thought only of being a mortal woman. He knew quite well that the truth was the other way around, but it made no difference to him just then. How do you know? he asked again. Prince Lear stopped walking and turned to face him. It was too dark for Schmendrick to see anything but the cool, milky shining where his wide eyes were. I did not know what she was until now, he said, but I knew the first time I saw her that she was something more than I could see. Unicorn, mermaid, lamia, sorceress, gorgon, no name you give her would surprise me or frighten me. I love whom I love. That's a very nice sentiment, Schmendrick said, but when I change her back into her true self so that she may do battle with the Red Bull and free her people, I love whom I love, Prince Lear repeated firmly. You have no power over anything that matters. Before the magician could reply, the Lady Amalthea was standing between them, though neither man had seen nor heard her as she came back along the passageway. In the darkness, she gleamed and trembled like running water. She said, I will go no further. It was to the prince that she spoke, but it was Schmendrick who said, There is no choice. We can only go on. Molly Grew came nearer, one anxious eye and the pale start of a cheekbone. The magician said again, We can only go on. The Lady Amalthea would not look straight at him. He must not change me, she said to Prince Lear. Do not let him work his magic on me. The bull has no care for human beings. We may walk out past him and get away. It's a unicorn the bull wants. Tell him not to change me into a unicorn. Prince Lear twisted his fingers until they cracked. Schmendrick said, It is true. We might very well escape the Red Bull that way even now, as we escaped before. But if we do, there will never be another chance. All the unicorns of the world will remain his prisoners forever, except for one. And she will die. She will grow old, and she will die. Everything dies, she said, still to Prince Lear. It is good that everything dies. I want to die when you die. Do not let him enchant me. Do not let him make me immortal. I am no unicorn, no magical creature. I am human, and I love you. He answered her, saying gently, I don't know much about enchantments except how to break them, but I know that even the greatest wizards are powerless against two who keep to each other. And this one is only poor Schmendrick, after all. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of anything. Whatever you have been, you are mine now. I can hold you. She turned to look at the magician at last, and even through the darkness he could feel the terror in her eyes. No, she said. No, we are not strong enough. He will change me, and whatever happens after that, you and I will lose each other. I will not love you when I am a unicorn, and you will love me only because you cannot help it. I will be more beautiful than anything in the world, and live forever." Schmendrick began to speak, but the sound of his voice made her cower like a candle flame. I will not have it. I will not have it so. She was looking back and forth from the prince to the magician, holding her voice together like the edges of a wound. She said, if there is left a single moment of love when he changes me, you will know it, for I will let the Red Bull drive me into the sea with the others. 
Then, at least, I will be near you.